go ahead. I think we are yep. recording right now. So hi everyone, welcome back from the break. Um, so as I mentioned, we have our guest speaker tonight and um, our guest speaker is Dr. Camille Dixon-Dean. Did I mention that correctly? Pronounce yeah. that correctly, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, is a native of Trinidad and Tobago, has her PhD in information science and learning technology, and focuses her research interest around the pedagogical usability of online learning environments. As a designer, researcher, evaluator, she has published several research articles and book chapters discussing research initiatives and the process of designing innovative instructional solutions specifically for the online realm. Her design and development ability is fueled by her research drive to always think about the uniqueness of solutions and why they did or did not work. And we have quite a history in instructional design and technology of things that did not work. Um, so thank you so much, Camille, for being here with us tonight. This class is about project management, and we cover um, project management within instructional design, and I thought you were the perfect um, guest speaker to get us started. I'm kind of calling this uh, series of guest speaker, let's talk about ID project management. And yeah, we're just really excited to have you. This is a pretty easygoing conversation. We just want to learn about your experience with project management and really like how did you get started in project management? Um, so okay. go ahead. I'll, I'll start with that. And that's the, an easy segue because um, I did project management before I became or what I thought I was at the time was just a normal instructor. I started project management way before I discovered instructional design. So I did my, my bachelor's is in computer science and I got a scholarship to do my master's in software development and management. And that's where my love and understanding for project management came about. Um, the way it is handled in the management, in the management field, is that it's based under those you know, management theories of leadership, um, what else, control, decision-making, those theories that come along when you have to, uh, I guess, guide the development and the product building of any kind of activity. And I did that and then became what is called a PMP. You see my... my, um, my titles and my certification behind my name and I do I do carry it along with me just like I do the PhD because it is a hard certification to achieve and maintain it's a project management professional and it's governed from the PMI Institute in, in in the US and Pennsylvania and at that time it took me three tries to get it and I missed out each time in the exam by maybe like two points Two points, two points, two points. When you get that, you go like, okay, that's it. Give up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, don't go back. <laughs> but, you know, my, I, I, had to, and I had to fly to Puerto Rico to do the exam. And my father was like, don't come home without getting it. Stay there two more days. We set the exam and do it. And I stayed. I stayed for a week. I went there initially for just two days. And I stayed for a week. And I came home with my PMP certification. That was in 2002, I believe. Yes. It's a, difficult, it's a difficult thing to achieve, but it's also difficult to maintain. So project management as a principle and as a, 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 a way of delivery and understanding, I always tell my students, because I taught project management first before I went into the ID field, that you do project management every single day of your life. You do it just naturally as a human being. I ask people, do you have kids? Do you have to manage yourself or manage a lot of activities in your life? You're doing project management. You don't know the terminologies and the, the, the labels that we assign to every single thing we do in the field, but in your life, you call it. How many of you have lists that you do? You make lists and then you prioritize that list. 
that's based that's the basis of project management <laughs> to prioritize and make the list and i make my kid do it all the time make a list prioritize oh she does every kid does it for santa claus for christmas <laughs> think about it these are the things i want this is the order of priority and then your parents or in my case me would say well what are you going to do to get these items on the list in that priority and they work towards it and that's the basis and foundation of project management um, when it gets to the field of instructional design it becomes a harder task to manage um, and i use the word manage to understand what we have as outcomes in terms of courses and the actions the services that we do and actually the product if we have a, a salient product at the end I understand that we have to manage the, those processes in order to get to learning and performance outcomes. So that melding of both of the fields is, is very easily done, but we don't think of it that, in that way. We think of it in the sense that um, I'm just working through the process. No, you're managing your risk. You're looking at your cost. You're thinking, okay, what about this decision over that decision and prioritizing your decisions? based on different criteria and different factors. All of that comes into project management. It's just a different way of thinking about what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm gonna stop there and you guys can feel and throw things at me, questions about my history, about where I've done it, how I've done it. I'm open to, you know, the, I'm open to anything and everything. <laughs> um, I, I wanna go back to getting your certification because okay. i know one of the questions that i get quite often is what do i do in order to get a certification what's the process like and i know you talked about like the exam being difficult but how much did you study how what what courses did you take how did you prefer you prepare yourself and i see you kind of laughing a bit so let me tell you the two i'm going to give you two hats one is a student when I did, um, when I studied for my PMP, there was maybe one or two people offering PMP preps in the region because I was still in the Caribbean at the time. And their advice, it was really, and it's good that I'm in the instructional design field to reflect on that question now and think that that was poor design. <laughs> <laughs> one of the first steps was we had to buy these 12 books and read them. <laughs> and as instructional designers, we all know the problems with that, there, that, that design right there. So that's the first thing they, they recommended. You bought these 12 books and you read them from cover to cover. Some of the books were like 500 pages long and with like textbooks. Some of them were like little novels. So, and I did it. I did it. I filled my head with all of this stuff. Didn't know what the stuff was. It was just in my head. That's it. And then we did a PMP prep with, I have to remember, is it Rita McCulley? I have to find out because she died a, a couple of years ago. She was just known. There was this lady who did the PMP exam and got almost 100%. And everybody was amazed at how she got 100%. What is the methods she used? So she created this into a training program. So we were all using her books. You could either use her books or find the $2,000 to attend her, her sessions, which no one had. So everybody just bought the book and did it. That was, as we can see, almost two decades ago. Since then, PMP has changed the exams, I believe, maybe three or four times. In some instances, people would say it's harder. In some instances, because now they, they're kind of positioning themselves as a leader, at least in the Western Hemisphere that they don't want too many PMPs. They want you to really try and earn it this kind of way, which is not a good learning principle or performance principle. Well, you have to earn it. Everyone learns and earns, but their, their idea is that you have to really work hard to get it. There's also PRINCE. PRINCE is another type of um, certification that is done in England. So there are two different ways you can um, approach this. PRINCE, in England and for the European people, the European body of, of knowledge has some of the same principles of PMP, but they're varied 
differently towards working in the government within England. Some government institutions in the Western Hemisphere will ask you to do PMP or Prince, right? But one is more heavily structured and geared towards government kind of work and government work is different or when you work in a public service, it's different kind of outcome. How did I get it? How do I recommend you get it now? There are tons of PMP preps out there. I always said you doing study groups is, a, is the best way to do your PMP as a low budget way. So I used to craft a lot of study groups, get people together, go through exams and test questions together and go through the answers and the rationale. I always assigned a person who had recently passed the PMP as a person to guide the study groups. So I had a tiered approach where I would just oversee on the top and I would say, well, okay, they have to learn it this way. There's a way they would like you to learn the content, right? Is it that way that you're going to act the content when you, or enact the content when you graduate? No, <laughs> has nothing to do with what reality is. It's just, they want you to learn it in a particular way. Right? So, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it just didn't make sense, but that's, if you want to pass it, there's a passing of the certificate and then there's the acting of what you do when you have the hat of the PMP. And I always tell people separate those two things because what I would have, and I train a lot of um, what I would call um, senior project managers in the field without designation who were told if you want to keep your job, you need to get the PMP certificate. And they're like, well, in reality, we don't do that. And I go like, yes, I know what reality says, but this is what the certificate would like you to do. And I walked through for the first two to three weeks, walking them through that process of, remember, you just need to get the certificate. You don't need to prove anything other than you have the core knowledge. So getting the certificate is doing study groups, reading, um, going through the, the um, PMP prep materials, and there are tons of them out there. Some are, some are better, some are bad, some are good. <laughs> um, but my way, a low budget way, is to go through it with someone who's recently or relatively new within the last three years who have taken it and who can help lead a study group that way. And that way you can get it fairly easily. Um, do you think it's worth it? Um, yes and no. It depends on what you want to do. Like I said, some jobs ask or require to show some level of certification or some knowledge in that position. Um, a lot, at least I'm being from the Caribbean, if you're going for a project management job, it is in the job spec. You have to have the certification. All right. Um, some other public services. When I was living in the U.S. in Columbia, Missouri, the government, the mid-Missouri government there, they also had an additional certification, which once you got the PMP, you had to be certified under their public service record as a working project manager in the field within Missouri. So is it worth it? If your job requires it, yeah, <laughs> just to get just to get the job. So what going forward? This position I got hired for. So this position I'm leading a bunch of leading designers who and we are all academic. We're not staff members, which is a different tier. Part of my job required I have some project management knowledge. That's what the the, the um, job spec said. And when they saw I was PMP and I put what the certification is, that was a, a big green flag for them immediately. Mm -hmm. So it has its pros and cons, right? And you just need to determine on your part or on your journey, if it would help you on that journey or if it will not. Some people can get through just doing some courses. I know there are tons like this, this course or I have some project management experience. I got the knowledge and then I did some projects. Mm -hmm. And that could suffice for some people. Some people say, well, hey, I need a certificate as, a, as an outcome. Okay. Well, that's good to know if wherever you're going to live, it's, or, you know, um, mm -hmm. whatever company you're aiming to is, is have that in their job specification, then I guess it's best to 
to get it and just be done with it. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just for everyone joining, I know we have quite a few that are not in the class. Um, feel free to chat, to type in the chat if you have questions or raise your hand or let us know if you have questions. I have questions of my own that I'll be asking to guide the conversation. But if you have questions, feel free to jump in and, and ask, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'll be monitoring the chat. Um, so you kind of touched a little bit on what you do now. Can you give us a little bit of an idea? This is also great because you're an instructional designer, senior lecturer, you're in a different country and it gives us like a little bit of a cultural framework as well. So can you tell us uh, what you do at the University of Technology, Sydney, and just kind of, you know, tell us okay. what you do. Well, I do. So basically, I help academics. I would say it, it almost feels like 200% of my time if there's such a, a, a classification in terms of percentages um, with getting their subjects into the online space, as well as ensuring that their subjects, and we call subjects here, but it's courses, their courses are tailored in such a way that the learning objectives and the learning outcomes that we put in those booklets and say students need to get this knowledge is really attained. So that's what my job is. So I help people with reassess their um, assessment design, reassess their learning environments, whether it's online or face-to-face. -face. Um, anytime we have problems, we will through it. So one of our biggest problems, and we call it this huge wicked problem, is assessing large cohorts so we have cohorts in excess um we the smallest class here is 45 and the largest goes into the thousands so that's the kind of gamut of um the body we're working with and an assessment when you're assessing especially in the scientific field where it's like um physics chemistry um biology Im immunology um, dealing with viruses, especially like coronavirus, we need to have assessments for critical thinking, and we also need to have assessments for the blanket level of um, proficiency. So there's a, a wiggle room between mastery skills as well as critical thinking that we need to have that right fit. And when you have a thousand people <laughs> passing through your class, it is difficult. So we have a lot of huge problems that we have to resolve and a lot of huge assessments where um, the idea of a multiple choice lends itself easy because it's a quick and easy and dirty assessment tool, but it doesn't really hit the, the mark when it comes to the critical thinking or comes to the active learning part of it. So basically that's what I do there from the professional side. And then from the academic side, I help people write that up into academic outcomes that they can share. Mm -hmm. And some of them hate doing that. And some people don't think it's valuable to write it up. But that's, that's part of my task in this new job. I've been here for a year. In my old job at University of Melbourne, it was similar, but it was for business faculty. And the business faculty, they have a different way of thinking within the discipline about their own um, profession as teachers and their own profession, whether it is an accountant, economist, et cetera. And the subject matter expertise or disciplinary knowledge melding with the profession of teaching. I help them doing the same thing I'm doing here, but from a business perspective. And their outcomes are different. Mm -hmm. So every, what I've learned is disciplinary knowledge have different outcomes from the professional point of view. And as a learning designer, you go in there to work within that space and understand those outcomes and get the best in terms of the learning going forward. And um, I know that you got your project management certification prior to going into like instructional design, learning design. Mm -hmm. um, how do you... Um, how have you put into practice project management in instructional design? Like what, I know that um, you put it, put it into practice in your prior position, you're putting it into this position, but like for future instructional designers, like what are some key things that you do related to project management? 
Okay, one of the major things I do is measuring risk. I can tell you that right now I'm working on a project where I'm moving everyone from Blackboard to Canvas. What risks are there? So the re so first thing, the rationale is we had initially a timeline of moving everyone from Blackboard to Canvas. We had three years. Great. Coronavirus came and everybody is already at home. And then none of the international students came. So we now have budget cuts. That's a huge project. Your project has just changed in terms of scope, delivery time. So now we've been told officially as of yesterday that we no longer have a timeline of three years. We now have a timeline of six months. What do we do to get everyone? So I have possibly, I would say 300 courses to move between today and the end of the year because our, our academic year starts in February, March next year to start a new year because they're decommissioning Blackboard by May, 2021. That's a wow. project. <laughs> wow. And when we talk about the instructional design part of it and the learning design of it, those who know the Blackboard space, so that's where you're, as a designer, your subject matter expertise and knowledge in terms of the features of Blackboard, and what are the features of Canvas? How are they similar? How are they different? Because when you tell an academic to move their, their subject across, they're thinking, okay, well, this is what I did in Blackboard and this is what I'm gonna do in Canvas. They don't know Canvas, so you have to walk them through the features of that environment. Once you've walked them through the features of that environment, we also have a model shift whereby before coronavirus, it was okay to do touch blends, what I call touch, little snippets of it. Blackboard was like a file holder. We know that, right? <laughs> so we know they had that and once in a while they make the students go into Blackboard and do something. Now with coronavirus and now with what, what we call ped pandemic pedagogy, it's now becoming what we're looking towards in the future. We have to have them have more interactions in that online space. What does that mean? So in my project plan, not only do I have, yes, they have the physical move, but I also have to upskill the academics to encourage the physical move. That's how I'm managing my risk. Because if I don't upskill them, they will move across and then their delivery will fail. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So in that whole process, you can see how the project management or the skills of identifying your phases and your activities and your processes will seamlessly go into how I look at designing for learning. So it's a hand in hand and you have to pull and tug going forward. So I have a bunch of sessions going to be running where I'm going to be working with academics, just on upskilling, but we can't tell them it's upskilling because academics, we all know, I hate it myself. I don't want to learn anything new. I'm done. I have my PhD. Don't tell me to learn anything. I know everything I need to know about life, right? I'm in that same boat as well. I'm doing a course right now and it's killing me to actually sit down and learn something. So upskilling, we have to tell them, well, hey, it's a new environment. When you think in Blackboard, in order to put a YouTube feature in or YouTube link in Canvas, this is how it's work and this is how it works and why it works. But we don't want you to do that. Why don't we want you to do that? Because it puts a load on the server. That's the learning design part of it. So putting a load on the server, they don't understand that. They just think we need the video there. <laughs> we go like, well, okay, we need you to upload the video to this video server, which will handle the load of streaming video into your online design. So now you can see where project management came in and where the learning designer in you came in. Having both of those sets of knowledges, we can manage those behaviors better. Is that a good example? <laughs> yeah, I mean, just transitioning everybody to a new platform, that just sounds really scary. Um, we actually transitioned to a new platform recently, but not the learning management system. We're kind of stuck with Blackboard. Um, mm -hmm. We transitioned from having, um, I don't know how you call it, like our student faculty space 
uh, mm-hmm. enrollment space, Spartan Web, and we transitioned to Workday. Um, so now faculty, um, students, and staff members or everybody is in Workday. So we just mm-hmm. recently had something similar happen at our institution. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? Everyone's really quiet. No questions? Okay. Uh, so I'll go, I'll keep going with my questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so tell me something um, that you don't like about project management. You mentioned when you were telling us about the individuals that they had to take the test and they were like, oh, this is not what we do in project management. This is just the test. Mm-hmm. What is something that you're taught about project management that is not um, like real life or like what is what is it that you don't like about project management as well yeah there's the knowledge and and that's exactly what i don't like there's the knowledge and then there's actuality what what really occurs and the knowledge that's in the textbooks and in all of the reading materials exactly just what i call stripped of context or strict of stripped of reality so they tell you that if you're making a WBS, which is a work breakdown structure, this is how you do it. If I were to leave here and I go to an organization, I say, well, okay, the book told me to do WBS this way. I guarantee you that organization is going to ask you like, what is that? No, that's not user friendly for our environment. We need you to do it this way. And you're going to have this internal fight with yourself between knowledge and actuality. And you're going to have to quickly either fuse those into one operational way of thinking and acting or you're just going to fail <laughs> so really i have funny because the students have to do a work breakdown structure next week so i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> so listen there there um there are two trains of talk with the work breakdown structure you either do it through the phased approach which is very um i think it's more american and then the EU, or I can't remember which one is which. One is a phased approach, and one is break down by the task structure. Whether you use verbs or nouns and all of these different things. When you get into the real world, it doesn't really saliently happen that way. And I've done work breakdown structures in organizations when I was just a software developer, where my work breakdown structure spanned walls. Let's think of a warehouse, the wall, the entire wall. And that you as a team would come and say, this area that is circled in green is our work to do in the work breakdown structure. And we report to this guy. And that's how it was used. And it didn't look anything like what I had learned in terms of the technicalities of what a work breakdown structure did. But isn't that, that, is, isn't that what we do in instructional design too? That we exactly. take all of these yeah. things and then when you go into the organization, it's just pure chaos, which now I'm just scaring everybody, but... Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's exact. That's why the two fields work. You think that you're doing instructional design when in fact you're actually doing project management and vice versa. They both go hand in hand. Go ahead. Is it Camilla? Yep. Yeah, we kind of have a similar name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So in the, uh, in the class before, um, you know, before you, you came online, we were discussing about the um, instructional design, uh, the relationship with the software engineering. Um, mm-hmm. That was kind of a complicated topic for me. I really didn't get the, um, you know, what um, correlation are, is between them. So, it's just the, the approach. It's just the methodology looks quite similar. And I can say across many fields, engineering, computer science and and development or software engineering, um, project management, they all have, so in computer science and software development and management, we have um, the waterfall. Don't know if you guys have heard the waterfall Uh, diagram. Right. And um, in ID, you can see that we have, um, what's a good, a good example. Sorry? Well, the, the article mentioned Adi. Adi. But yeah. You know, well, no. Do you know how we feel about Adi? <laughs> Adi is the third <laughs> model for actually designing. Adi is a good reference for, <laughs> right? Um, 
I'm I'm, I'm drawing blanks here. Um, what else have you guys found? Dick and Clark. Dick and Clark, a model. Right. So if you look in there, if you look at Dick and Clark's model, you can actually see where um, in a waterfall design, you can see the different phases happening. In project management, we have the initiation, planning, and I just, I just literally read it again to remember, execution and monitoring, and then close out. Yeah. But what has happened in the field since when I did it in 2002, and this is why I had a problem actually taking that set technical knowledge and translating it into actuality is that in actuality, everything is iterative. I can start my initiation, go to my execution and then jump quickly to evaluating and run back to my initiation. When I learned project management, yeah. that was not the case. It was like, no, you do this and then you finished. <laughs> and then you go, you open the next door and you go to this and then you finish that. And I was like, no one operates in reality that way, right? The doors are left open and people go through each of the doors as they need to, to yeah. tighten their project going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have another question in the chat. Um, Kate asks, what is more important in project management? One, to properly identify the goals of the project, to do an excellent project plan, or to have a talent to execute the project? That's a hard question. Let me tell you why. <laughs> because depending on your project, each of those will be seen equally as important or more important than the other, depending on your goal. I would just tell you, the most important thing in project management is to please your stakeholders. You can have a successful project and your stakeholder could hate you. And they will say to you, you did not have a successful project. <laughs> and we had Even this conversation <laughs> last week, <laughs> didn't we? <laughs> yeah. Even if you do every single thing that the project asks you to do, if your project manager, if your stakeholder, your primary, especially your sponsoring, the one who's paying your bills, does not like you, how they felt, the way you answered them, five months ago, your project has failed. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> right? And I'm not, I, I really am, I'm not exaggerating that in any way. So I've had projects where the goal was never clear. Most times with a stakeholder, the goal is never clear. 90% of the time, only maybe when they reach maybe 50% or to 60% of the project, do they go like, oh, this is what we really want. Right, and by that time, half your money is gone. Right, they can reach there, reach to the end, get the project, and then go. You know what? She did a pretty good job. So I like it. I like her. Yeah, the project is successful. I've had people who said, "I really don't like that girl." <laughs> <laughs> so it gets personal. It can get personal. I'm sorry to say, and that's the truth. That's the truth. I've had, I, and I'm not seeing many guys here. Oh, Mark is there. Mark, sorry. I'm gonna just, <laughs> as you say in my country, lambase some males. But I've had men, and I've worked in a very paternalistic climate in my country where women are always seem to be not good enough for men because of that's just the climate and, and the culture in my country. Oh my and I, my projects were always supervise i had canadian partners who would come in as the as the voice because if i were to speak it would be a problem so i would just tell them listen they were coming they would fly in from canada to trinidad for two days i'll brief them on what we're doing and where we're doing and why we're doing what we're doing and then they'll tell me okay so what what are the challenges and they say okay great and then they'll present it and my stakeholders will be happy ecstatically happy and then the one day they miss their flight, stakeholders send back a report. They are not pleased with where the project is going. They would like um, some revisions made, et cetera, et cetera. And he goes, I missed one flight. I said, I told you. <laughs> and that's how, I don't know, is it um, Kate. Jake, 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 Jake Katerina? Kate? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Did that help? Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, mm -hmm. ev so the actual class, I, um, there's six uh, females in the class. So what advice would you have? Uh, because, you know, we have, we talk about this thing. So what advice would you have for females wanting to go into a leadership role like project management or even just leadership roles within their organization? Uh, what advice would you have based on the experiences that you've, you've had in the past? You need to get a lot of mentors in your back pocket, first and foremost. You have to be able to get mentors from the field, mentors that can relate to your scenario, and just mentors in general. You, you don't get a men one mentor for everything. You get a mentor for a reason, right? I have mentors who help me with research, and I have mentors who are from my country who says, oh my gosh, yeah, this is what happens at home. Or if I move to Australia now, I have a mentor who's Australian who is say, well, in Aussies, we don't do these things. So you can't talk that way and you can't explain yourself that way. You need to get mentorship as a part of just enhancing and making what I call making your soul whole that you can succeed in this field. And you can. Once you understand that, another thing you have to do is get a very thick skin. There are going to be many times you're going to go down and you think you're down and you're not going to be down. You're just learning and, and being successive and successful as you go forward. Always be humble. Always be humble. In my language, you would see sometimes, any, anytime I'm talking to my boss or anybody else, I would say, may I have this word? Or can I, can I please? It sounds very submissive. But in the field of, I'm not instructional design, but in terms of the project management realm, that's what is needed. It sounds very backward, but you're still thinking, you're still getting your outcome at the end. The key is to get to your outcome. What do you need to do to get to your outcome? And that's what you need to focus on. You can switch your hats and be the empowering you at home, which is what I do. And, and the other knows that that's what I do. I'm the empowering person elsewhere. But when I come onto my job, I take on a different persona because these are the things that are needed to take on and get to the end of the goal because that's why you were hired. I've had um, a couple of other colleagues in project management. I have a friend, very close friend, um, who's in civil engineering and she's a project manager in civil works. And she's Jamaican. Jamaicans curse readily. She didn't. <laughs> so you went on a job site and there is just cursing in every... Every three, four words is a curse word. And she was just like, is that the only way you can talk? And her boss immediately dropped her from being in charge of, she was doing um, what you call luxury houses built. From, she was in charge of the whole project. Then she was demoted to just being in charge of refurbishing a, a bathroom. <laughs> Because, because she, she objected to, to, to the language being used on the construction site. Well, so it, uh, it, she was right. I mean, it, 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 it's a culture, I think. It's so. cult you, you have to understand every... So you have the country, but then when you go to your jobs, you also have the culture within your job. So even though I'm in Australia... I can tell you the, the culture in University of Melbourne is absolutely different from where I am now in University of Technology in Sydney. It's absolutely different. I can tell you in UTS, which is University of Technology in Sydney, the Faculty of Social Sciences has a different culture than the Faculty of Science or the Faculty of Engineer. You have to adapt to your surroundings and understand that not come in there like a force and say, this is how I'm going to behave and you have to accept me and I don't care. Know that you can partition yourself. You can have that part of you, but you also need to understand what they're working with in that part and understand how to move quickly between those two hats within your life to get to your outcome. It's always to get to your outcome. Thank you, Camille. Um, I have another question in the chat. Um, this is from Scarlett. 
In addition to the PMP, what other certification experience should an employee have to be successful in the project management field? So, and <clears throat> I also hold Six Sigma. I don't know if you guys have talked about that as yet. Not yet. Six Sigma, Six Sigma and I'll put it in the chat window. And I didn't do the black belt because I just felt I had enough of learning. I'm a green belt in Six Sigma. Six Sigma has three colors, yellow, green, and black, All right? And my husband is actually a black belt. And it's just also like the PMP certification where you always have to do a lot of upkeep of your certifications. So it was just too much for me. Six Sigma talks about quality in the quality realm, quality improvement. And it goes really nicely in hand with project management as well as our feelers IDs. Because when we talk about, if for instance, I'm, I'm talking about moving academics from Blackboard to Canvas, if you notice, I talked about the longevity of that move and the upskilling, because not only do I just want to move them, I want to make sure that the delivery and the outcomes towards the students are better. That's a quality improvement um, principle there, that they have the ability in Blackboard to deliver towards their students successfully but would they be able to maintain that same ability when they move to Canvas? So looking at quality improvements um, and that realm, Six Sigma works well. Experience, in your, in your arm, and I'm sure Nilda will help you with this, where you can do projects and do, take up a lot of pro bono work. That's what a lot of my students do. They're doing it right now. And the world is open for pro bono work. You don't have to do something huge. You can do something small. Can I help with this project? That builds experience and that can go on your CV as working with a project manager or working with a quality improvement expert. In the project management realm, in PMP, there are other certificates underneath there. There's a risk management, there's the quality, and then there's the program manager. So you can be a project manager professional or program manager, management professional, which is the PGMP, which is a higher level. To get to the higher level, normally they require you to do numerous projects, be managing numerous projects at the same time and classify it as that. That's what the technical definition in project management is. I'm going to tell you as a project manager, you already are managing several projects at the same time but they need it to be of a different value. So typically my husband would manage maybe five or six projects for a total of $80 million. That's how they talk about it. So your six or seven projects, $80 million, you reach in that program manager certification level. Yes, we will allow you to do this certification. Yes, we will be recognized. You can manage one project that is $80 million they go like, okay, explain that. And then you'll find out that under your project, you have some projects or mini projects going on. All right. So there's a difference between program and project. There's a difference between risk management. Um, there's also a schedule. I think there's also a schedule certification. Managing schedulers. I think there is a scheduling. I have to look it up again. There is a scheduling certification as well or the PMP, but these are like unique skills. It's like what Anilda described me as an instructional designer, but I focus on online. Mm -hmm. There's some people who only focus in the face-to-face -face environment. It's like that skill trait. Camille, would you recommend somebody, I know that certifications can be pricey. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend someone doing it on their own or working with their companies? Do you think companies are open to like sponsoring? Company, companies are sometimes open. In this climate, I'm not sure, but companies sometimes pay for you. So my company sent me and they sent and they paid for one, they give you one try. <laughs> and that's why I stayed for the other two tries <laughs> because there, there's an expectation that when I return, to get, um, there's no reimbursement, but when I return, they expected me to come back with it. Mm -hmm. okay. So there are some companies who would pay and sponsor, and there's nothing 
in you to ask your seniors, would you be willing to, I don't have this, would you be able to help me in terms of education? There's an education part of it. So this subject that you're doing, this course that you're doing should go towards the education. I think it's 35 contact hours. Can you help me pay for the actual exam? You can ask that. Be prepared for a no and you'll be play, pleased with the outcome. <laughs> That's what I always say. <laughs> I guess. Uh, yeah. Never hurts to ask, right? Never hurts to ask. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, questions? Any other questions from anyone? Okay. Um, can you share a little bit about your studies? Because we kind of got start, started and you talked about your studies. Um, you were studying um, in the West Indies, but then you transitioned to the United States. Can you talk a little bit about um, going to do your PhD in the United States? And what was that experience oh. like? <laughs> Days. Um, I only talk about these, some of these discussions because it's a hard it's a hard one and i know that it will know it's it's doing your phd in the, in the u.s it's very difficult especially if you're coming from a different country um i got a scholarship to do my masters about the same exact year that i got married which was a hard task in the caribbean we have what is called the organization of american states and they readily um, sponsored people to go do your master's. I did my master's in Rochester Institute of Technology in RIT, upstate New York. And um, that's my first scholarship that I got externally. My, my family normally, a lot of people will get scholarships and go abroad and study and come back. I didn't wanna come back, all right? I was just like, yeah, my brain works a lot better here. Uh, as a woman, I feel a little more empowered. And I'm not restricted at home. I, I'm not restricted as I am at home. People actually want me to talk and they want to hear what I have to say. I don't want to go back home. So <laughs> RIT was like, we will help you. We will help you stay. You can stay. You can do this and you can work for us and do that and everything. And I was working also there in a company, which is now, um, is it called Reuters now? I think it's called Reuters. Or it's Thompson, Thompson. Mm -hmm education at the time. I was working for Thompson at the time with West Group. We were doing a lot of analysis of data, getting all of the, the legal laws that you see those legal textbooks, call it Westlaw, and we were writing code to parse those into an online format. That was a long time ago. And they loved the work I was doing. They were like, yes, yeah, stay, we'll help you stay. My government was like, ha we will come and seize your lands. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how working in different countries, you understand. So my mother was like, I'm not going to lose the house because you didn't come back. Get your tail back home. So I went back home. <laughs> not happy. When I got back home, part of the agreement with working through that scholarship was that the government, you basically have to pay it back to the government and give it back to the society. And part of that was that the government will find a job for you in society that meets, meets the qualifications of that we sent you abroad to get. Um, the, there's a huge challenge, a huge cultural shift required when a person comes back home in that where they learned and the, under the conditions under which they learned are not duplicated in their home countries. It's difficult for them to assimilate or reassimilate. And it's, there's a satisfaction factor that is ignored in that process. That was ignored in my case. They didn't have a job for me, so I was home for like six months sitting down, waiting for them to find a job. So I found a job, guess where? In the university, teaching exactly what I had learned in software development and management, et cetera. That's how I became a teaching professional. Funny enough, um, I was there for maybe three years still feeling like my brain is being compressed because no one wants to listen to me. And the U.S. government emailed me and said, listen, there, you're, you're over the period of time where you can go up for another scholarship. We have all of this money in Fulbright. Would you want to go for Fulbright? I was just like, oh my God, learning again. 
I don't know what is entailed. So apply, uh, whatever they gave me a deadline to apply, I applied, never completed the application, was just exhausted. <laughs> and they called me and they goes, you have an interview, but before you come to the interview next week, we need you to complete the application. I go like, that's not how it works. You normally look at the application and then <laughs> give they the really want it you. <laughs> yeah, so I was just like, and my mother's like, you're going again? You're going up there again? I go like, yeah. <laughs> and I did it. And they really, they really kind of cajoled me to do my PhD based on what I was saying, which was I did all of this work in computer science and the software development field. I'm now an academic and something is wrong with how we teach our fields. There's something wrong there and it's not working in this country. We just, in, in the Caribbean, we just tell you and you're just supposed to understand there's something wrong. And it said, yeah, read up on this. This is what we want you to go do. This is where we're gonna send you back. You need to complete all of these applications, great. I was sent first to University of Connecticut. And University of Connecticut at that time was renowned in the ed tech field. They, at that time when I landed, they were closing down the ed tech program. Oh, wow. <laughs> Fulbright didn't know, no one knew. So I had to move from Fulbright. A lot of uh, um, Michael Young is at um, University of Connecticut. Um, Bob Hannafin, which is Mike Hannafin's younger brother is at University, um, can't remember, Mike Scott. These were people that were more ed psych related before the tech, right? So I got a transfer to Missouri and because Missouri was taking a lot of Fulbrights and that's where I did my PhD. So that's just my adult life of moving. You should know that my grandparents live in the US, still are, my, my, my grandmother's just in a hundred this year. She lives in Brooklyn, has all her life. We have, we, the way we are in our family, we just have a diverse voice of where people live. My brother lives in England. I have family in Scotland. We've, my uncles and aunts are from Brazil and, and Venezuela. So we just have a widespread, so we're used to traveling and we're used to going and staying for long periods of time. So when I moved to Australia, I was the first, by the way, the family to move to Australia. Australia was one continent nobody had conquered. And I bring all of that history and all of that knowledge with me into what I do wherever I go. And that is what makes me aware and easily adaptable when I go to places understanding on what's going on. Did I answer the question, Inelda? Uh, yes, you did. Of course you did. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's a lost uh, question in my head. Yeah. Uh, we have um, a question, and I perhaps it, this might be the, the last one, um, because we don't want to steal too much of your time. And she says, based on your ID experience so far, which aspect is most relevant, comes handy to PMP, risk, quality, scope, any specific project example too? Okay. Um, I have to think about it because I'm running a subject right now with students in the Caribbean. And the first thing I always challenge with them is scope. Scope of your project. Because the risk, the quality, the time, the cost, all depends on your scope. The most thing I can say to people is with your scope, that boundaries of this is what the project looks like in this box, nothing more. Something is in scope and something is out of scope. When I use it to, when I get very technical with people and I go like, that's out of scope. They go like, what? Put it in scope. I go like, ah, <laughs> are you giving me more money? Are you going to manage your resources better? Are you going to uh, help me with my risk? Because if I put that in scope, it just filters and explodes into the what, ifs, hows, whens, and buts, right? So I always say your scope is your first priority. Make sure that people know what's in scope and make a list of those things and make sure people know what is out of scope, make a list of those things. So for me to move academics from Blackboard to Canvas as a good example, what is out of scope for me? Out of scope is the building of Canvas. 
that is out of scope. So when other people say to me, well, I don't have this feature in Canvas, I say to them, great, I have to put out another team that is out of scope for my team. If you want that feature that's in Canvas and we don't have it, that goes to another team. And they look at me and go like, you make it your team. And I go like, no, <laughs> it's out of my, out of my, because if I include that and if I go into features, I have to extend my team to go deal with that problem. And your that budget. Budgets. Budget, it includes risk as well if I don't have the knowledge set on my team. If I don't have the ability on my team to solve that problem that they would like me to resolve, it puts me at risk. Just as a resource, it puts me at risk, all right? And it puts the project at a risk as to being a failure. So managing your scope is the biggest thing I, I think you should really focus on in any, any project. Well, thank you very much, Camille. I just wanna okay. see, oh, we have another question. I thought I saw someone's hand go up. Mm -hmm. Maybe I just made that up. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, you are our first guest this semester. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, a few more, um, mm -hmm. but I appreciate you coming in and talking to us because I feel like you bring so much more than just project management. Um, you also bring your instructional design experience and you have all these cultural aspects that are really important. And just FYI, we actually have quite a few international students in class. So Monique is from uh, Grand Cayman. Kate oh. is from uh, Estonia. Um, Camilla is half Turkish, half Chinese, if I got that right. Yeah. Uh, Indira is from Venezuela. And so Anu, we're neighbors. Yes. And <laughs> An Anu is from Nigeria. And Scarlett is from Venezuela as well. So we're like a firm, most of us are international in scope. So I Beautiful. think that, yeah, it's great to have you in class and to bring that international cultural perspective. And I know how you feel about the term international. So I'm not going to say it too much. <laughs> no, but I get what you mean. I get what you mean. And, and maybe, you know, though, maybe one day I can introduce you to my Caribbean cohort. And you can bring your students in and well, we use Blackboard Collaborate, which is a pain to use. No one uses their, um, their cameras because it's such a load on um, machines. But um, yeah, maybe we can do something that way and just share along those lines, the cultural parts of the field of learning design and instructional design. I, I think would love that's that, yeah. Very, very key mm -hmm. going forward. All right. So if yeah. you guys want to contact me, I'll send Nilda. She has all of my contact details sure. it's there. You can find me online and have a great class and do well. Thank it's you so much. Thank <laughs> you very okay. much. And please stay safe. We will do. You too. You all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you, Camille. Mm -hmm.